the 35A72 should be stated for those who have no understanding of why it might be that. It would be the 35th orbit that is being cited and the 72nd frame of that orbit. It then goes 35 orbits further, and now we are at orbit 70 and frame 13. The A simply means Viking 1. That's all the A means. But otherwise, it could just as easily be read 35.72 or 70.13 or altogether just 35.72 and 7013. Those numbers are fine in and of themselves. In fact, they are what should be there. Those were not just photo images that were marked with convenient numbers. Oh no! Those were orbital positions that the frames were following. Orbital positions. And that means, in effect, that you have to have a zero point, and anything that follows from there has to be programmed according to a gridding of the planet which is already established. In other words, that's a cartographic necessity. Right. Otherwise, it would be sheer chaos. <laughs> There's enough of that to go around. But anyway, the point is that the orbits in and of themselves had to have a centering for the vectors, the approach vectors. That's a tricky piece of business. And there had to be one image which was so powerfully stated, so easily seen from that distance of what they were from, the surface of Mars, in order to apply the vector approach correctly. And that was a little bit out of sync with what's here. The face happened to be along with that as a point, and I'm not going to argue with the figure. I'm simply going to say that that's not the real issue. The real issue is what is it that's common to 35A72 and 70A13, that was a powerful enough vector locator. You, um, you have to think of it this way. What is it the real estate people say? Location is everything? Something like that. Location, location, location is everything. Whatever the statement is. I'm never involved in re myself in real estate, so I don't know, except for Mars is real estate. And in this case, the point of approach had to be on an object, as I say, so powerfully positioned that it could not be other than the centering issue. Not in the center, but the centering issue for the vectors. And that was a five-sided pyramid, which I guarantee you nature doesn't make. Nothing five-sided in nature is five-sided that I know of, especially not that massive. It would cover the entire Giza Plateau and all the pyramids within. The point is, that was at 40.87 north. 40.87. Now, that is what lies between the 35.72 and on the other side, the 70.13. But those numbers also are involved in hundreds of equations, just as they are either with the decimal point in the center or no decimal point at all, depending upon the use. But the important point here is that even so, along came someone into one of the reporters' uh, lives and said, oh, it's not 40.87, it's 40.868. Don't shy from this point please. This is a deliberate distortion. Let's call it for what it is. Well, the Wikipedia claimed it was 40.75. For the face. 
But we're not talking about the face. Uh -huh. We're talking about the apex of the five-sided pyramid. The I understand. apex. That's this. That, that's that, yes. The... But the thought, the wrongful thing was to come along and say, hmm. no, it's not forty point eighty-seven. It's forty point eight six eight. Because yeah. any school child should know beyond the age of three <laughs> or third grade, start again, uh, that um, the eight would kick the six up to seven anyway. That's not the point. What is the 4087 doing? Well, coming from the sun side, couldn't you read that as 7804? Of course you could. And the synodic revolution of the planet Mars from Earth's position is 780 days till it comes back to, back to the same place in the sky. And what planet is it? It's number four. So, of course, the license plate could read 7804. So, what's better than to locate the vector at 4. Point, you know, or 4087, rather? Obviously. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't ask for a more clear statement on the part of an ancient culture. And we, was it in the languages that <clears throat> these numbers came to you um, when you uh, first discovered the, uh, the, that north uh, marker? Not really. That just came from being what I am, a Samanas, and I was a child with this particular channel capacity. And the Samanas is a word that no longer exists in Greek, hasn't existed for a long time, but that's what Homer was, hmm. and that's what many other people were, uh, that were part of the science and the uh, music systems and the language systems and so on. But no, I just received it as it was, and I received the image. When I was five years old, I saw the entire Sidonian site in its pristine form before any damage, and that was selective damage, was done. Mm -hmm. That was an extraordinary sight. I'll never forget it. It was beautiful beyond description. Now, all I'm saying is that I had it given me, just like the 3572 was given me, the 7013 was given me. I was nothing but the messenger writing it down as it came, without the least bit of understanding of what the hell it was. And I'm afraid that much of what I took down was exactly that way. The frequencies and the alphabets are a thing apart, but they're connected. They're just not in that particular calculation. What this was was simply, flatly, a place in the latitude, regardless of what would be east or west of that, it was still north 40.87. And knowing that, I realized that here we have something that's a direct statement of pe some persons who came from Earth, that's right, they weren't aliens, they were now in an alien world. They were at Mars putting up some things that were sign significant that they came from Earth, but they were Earthlings looking back at Earth, reflecting, looking at them. And it was a way of saying, this is where we've come because we know something is happening here that must be recorded for the family of man. So that's where that began. And the important point of that is, again, let me stress it. You had Earth's people doing this from the standpoint that would not reflect what you would see from Mars. It's rather what you would see from Earth if you were looking at Mars. And nothing like a mirror. It works wonders. You don't see anything but yourself. And when they went to the second stage of the dream, which was sometime later, I think it was maybe a fortnight apart, something like that, 14 days, I'm sorry, um, something like that. But remember, I'm a five-year-old child, I don't remember everything. The time out of mind in this case was it was close enough for me to have in the second dream I received as this Samanamas, by the way, uh, the word shaman descends from that in a Siberian form. Saman namas. You can hear it's a palindrome. 
but the version that everybody knows is shaman, which is like, you know, a medicine man or a priest or whatever, you know, it's descended from there. Um, the important point here is the second one I saw, I saw what I came to think of as a deliberately damaged site. Let's repeat that. Deliberately, selectively destroyed in parts. But the rest that were in pristine shape, like that three wall version, is perfect in itself. The top uh, wall is a sea mile at 6,080. Omega, less than that, 800, less than that, is the land mile at 5,280. And then 800 less than that is the birth mile, 4480. And the birth mile was so called because it was the one that was hanging down. And it was also the distance a woman had to walk when she was pregnant to help with the lightning before the birth and before the breaking of the water. And they damaged that wall. It was a nuclear strike from the air. It is not damage that occurred by somebody just blowing up portions of the wall. No. And the black shadow next to it was an identical image of the thing which is embraced by that wall next door to it, which is the alpha, that's an A, mu, that's an M, omega, which is the open O with feet, so to speak. And that's the mother in a sense. But the Alpha Mu Omega is also the basis for the Greek alphabet. Because it's there that you have the frequencies of the alphabet which are mainstay, where the octaves occur. The two octaves apart. Okay. Could you describe how you documented um, these dimensions on Mars, um, even before the mission that took off? Well, I would have to go into quite some length, but this is the... Let me try to go in the direction I'm going. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to explain how easily I did this. Because when a child, you're not looking for trouble. You really aren't. It'll find you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's life. But I simply wanted to know what was alpha. What was a way of showing what alpha was? There had to be a way. Even if it had to be, you know, like the architect building the house from the roof down. That's quite a trick. So I went, I said, okay, if I can't be knowing what alpha is, what about mu? What about the middle? No, that didn't yield either. So I said, well, let me go to omega. That's at the top in the sense, but also at the bottom. But remembering the words of Jesus, because I was a good little Christian kid, I said, hmm, he said the first shall be last and the last first. Well, I certainly knew what that was all about because I was one of the shortest in my class. <laughs> and I was always at the end of the line anyway, trying to see around all the tall boys. But anyway, it was this. I looked up and I said, okay, what are the standards? Here we are on Earth. Who's closest to the sun besides Mercury? Mars is not closest to the sun. It's the furthest on the other side. It's Venus, the mother goddess. So I said, aha, Aphrodite. Uh, I did not pronounce it like Aphrodite, as my family and so many others did, because I used to say Aphrodite without her nighty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I get myself in trouble for that. But it was that Venus was on one side and Mars was on the other. But since Mars had the governance of the area being furthest away from the sun, Mars had to have the alpha position besides, what, who, who didn't know the term alpha male? <laughs> I didn't know anybody calling it an alpha female. So anyway, I simply said, okay, take 780.584, the synodic revolution of Mars on one side of the point, and we are the point, the observer. Put the point where it belongs, and then have 584 over here, the female. So 780 times 
0.584, or even if you did it the other way around, it would work. What you have is 455.52. And I said, oh, all I have to do is take away 100 for the scale, 10 times 10. Take away. It's 355.52. That's omega. If I divide it in half, it's 7.76. If I di divide that in half, then I find alpha, and alpha has to be paired numbers right across. They have to be all eights, so it was 88.88. .88. And it was a perfect match because what is sidereally 88 days in the sky? Mercury. Oh. And then I put together Mercury. Oh, this is all misleading because that's all Roman names. So we don't need that for the moment. We need to hold with the Greek. Hermes. And what do we know about the connection between Aphrodite, or Venus, and Mercury. Aphrodite and Hermes, hermaphrodite. It's right in the English language, coming from the Greek. So I said, aha, they must have married those two times. 225 sidereal for Venus, that's the time it takes her to go around the sun, and 88 days for Mercury, that's 313. Well, what happens with 313? I said, we don't have any measures that apply to 313. But then I thought, mm -hmm. take 1,088 feet per second. That's approximately the sound at sea level, given certain atmospheric conditions and locations, but certainly around the belt of the equator. 88, 1,088, rather. And I noticed something about that, too. Remember, I'm just a kid with an inquiry. I can't get a question or two answers, so or 10, 1, 2, or 10. I can't get them answered so, by anybody. So, And now the books aren't helping me, so I say, well... 1 plus 8 plus 8 is 17, ignoring the 0, because it, mathematicians do. And I said, if you multiply it, it's 64, and 70, 17 times 64 it returns 1,088. So it's sound and resound, or echo. It's a hermaphroditic concept. So therefore, the 313 divided into the 1,088 must give you a constant which holds true, regardless of how, how many times you increment a month incrementalize it up to three. It stops at three. Well, we're the third planet, aren't we? So, the logic was placed. And I simply said, okay, from there I know the rest. All I have to fill it in is by the twelfth root of two, which will be the distance from every semitone to every other semitone. All white and black keys together, tell your cat that. You can't make a mistake, honey, here you go. You know, and so, this is the idea that I go by. And then I start applying it to measure. It is at that point that I say, wait a minute. It's not just there for frequency location of strings. I don't believe that for one New York minute, so to speak. That expression wasn't around in that day, but that'll do. I simply was now in the position of Vit devil's advocate saying did the Greeks really leave all of this and also something on Mars that would indicate why it was given the title of the god of war and Aphrodite why she was supposed to be the vamp on the ramp <laughs> you know this is bad stuff I'm saying because this is a mis calculation of all of the wonderful things that may have been the case before the atmosphere of Mars collapsed. And are they trying to tell us something? And is this something anti-nuclear? This is when I'm five. I had quite a bit of time to think about it until 1945. Three full years. And those were very full years. My grandfather took me in hand, that was my mother's father, Schwein, which we pronounce throughout America as Schwinn, same family as make the bikes, they're my cousins. Although I never had a Schwinn bike and didn't want one. <laughs> it was bad enough that they called me by my mother's maiden name because she was so famous as an illustrator. Even when I went to the uh, illustrator's club or wherever I went, uh, they would call me Bart Schwinn. I'd say, no, I have a father. <laughs> but anyway, that being aside, Barbara Schwinn, she was absolutely thoroughly famous and deserved to be. She was in a man's world all by herself. And uh, 
her father was really the reason I was able to advance the things I had because he had a magnificent library. He was so highly gifted in his own right, educated, and um, sometimes my family would call him the tailor, but he was hardly that. He was the Beau Brummel of New York. He had um, a, a clothing store which was frequented by some of the most famous people of the day. One of them was Douglas Fairbanks. Another one I can think of was Paderewski. And then another, everybody knows, Houdini. My grandfather made all his suits that had the trick pockets and the rest. So, <laughs> there you go. But my grandfather could um, do anything he needed to do as a machinist. He carved beautifully, both hands, both hands at the same time. That's something. The only other person I knew that could do that was a carver amongst the Haida, who was probably the most famous of his day. And that was the, I think, grandfather, maybe, or father of the um, activist amongst the Haida, um, Levina White, a fabulous woman in her own right. Now. All I can say is that my grandfather, who, like his mother, wrote and spoke ten languages. He also rode with uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Rough Riders, in his youth. Was pulled out of the ranks to be an interpreter. That was interesting. But he had a very colorful life. He was also a Diamond Skull's oarsman. Diamond Skull's oarsman. A very rare thing. And a three and uh, what is a hole in one golfer? A number of times, three times, I think. But he was a man who was very accomplished, and looking up at him, I had nothing but a mammoth task to try to keep him even, even with some of the things he was talking about. But he set me to doing the chemistry, the physics, and of course the languages. Yeah. And he started, because I said, because he would be listening to his shortwave radio in the various languages. And I said, Grandpa, can I please learn the family languages, which were French and German, um, the Irish aside. And he said, no. I was mystified. No. Didn't say. Why not? I knew better to do that. He said, first, the ancient languages. Greek, oldest language in the world, by far. Then. Hebrew and Aramaic, because Aramaic is actually far older than Hebrew. And that's the language in which the Hebrew prophets had to write in because Hebrew wasn't developed enough. Mm. Just like the Roman armies couldn't possibly have conducted business against their neighbors without having all of their patrician officers speak Greek. All the battle orders were issued in Greek. They were not in Latin because Latin was too few in words and capacity for any subtleties to speak of. And with your enemy, you have to be subtle. <laughs> so I began this study delaying the German and the French for at least a year. I began at age five. And I definitely was very early set upon uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, right there was the clue about Mars. Because I saw, I saw some people actually had counted out the lines of the Iliad in Greek. It doesn't do any good to count in translation, because that's going to be a completely different number every time. In Greek, it was exactly 15,693 lines. The Odyssey was 12,109 lines. And I had heard these disparaging remarks about, well, Homer was so old, he didn't have the energy to write anymore, and things like that. Silly, stupid things to come out of otherwise intelligent people. And I simply <coughs> said, no. If you add them, it's 27802. Oh, In other words, the two on the one side would be solar. The two on the other side would be lunar, the 780 in the middle, the monkey in the middle, was what we see as Mars 
appearing in the sky 780 days later. What is the subject? Is it a Sunday afternoon in the park? No, the subject is war and all the ravages and horrible things that happened with war. And so I looked at it from the standpoint of also being a guide as to what was actually on the surface of the planet somewhere. And the more I looked at it, the more I saw a connection with that which was nuclear. That's what began it. And then the investigation of the language allowed me to, to place names, deity names, all the things that were in place for us within the histories that were being totally ignored. The names were there, the languages were there, but nobody gave it a thought. We just inherited stuff, and it was boring at that, or so it seemed, except for specialized scholars. Not true. Not true at all. But because I'm this little kid that doesn't know any better, I started to launch into these things. And I remember at one point I stopped and I ran into my grandfather, because I had to keep up with my Bible studies too, and I said, Grandpa, who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews or the Romans? He said, neither. I was stunned by the remark, but said nothing. Waited. Power killed Jesus. It doesn't make any difference what agent was exercising that power. It was power. And that's what's going to destroy man. The use, the bad, horrible use of power. And that is really driven by something called the ego, which I know by this time you know what it means, coming from the language background that you have at, at your command. And I knew all right. And it wasn't too much later or longer before Dr. Robert W. Wood, an amazing scientist, amazing personality, he happened upon me in the East Hampton, Long Island Library. Wood had seen this global type Thing. It looked like a Dutch oven with rainbow colors all over it, which we did cover to some yeah. degree, but not the actual measures. And he um, stopped and asked, son, w what is that? And I said, oh, it's Greek. I said, but it's an indication of the abuse of light and the challenge to the statement in Genesis 9-11, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between, you know, and, and so it reads. The point was that the rainbow was the covenant and we had broken that covenant. And we had now used something nuclear to do so. That was the covenant, the use of the uh, splitting of the atomic bomb. Well, that was the major break of the covenant, yes. The thing that was so obvious and in your face. Yeah. And we had done it with Hiroshima, with 235, and we did it with um, 239 to Nagasaki. Right. I had nothing to do with the Hiroshima except to supply the correct atomic weight for the 235, which appears that way in nature. And that was a case of symmetrical resonance. Uh, reciprocal resonance, rather. The point was that going back to what you were asking about, I had to show Dr. Wood that I had already considered the source, in a sense of Mars being the source, and I had placed the innermost moon at 5,820 miles from the center of Mars. I saw what the ancients were trying to do. We knew that the land mile had 5,280 feet to the mile, 
and I saw the best way they could do the thing, like my mother from time to time, because I was called Bart, my father was Bert, so I had to do something. So I also noticed that my mother sometimes would shift the A and the R. So what would emerge was not Bart, but Brat. So <laughs> she didn't do it very often, but I caught the idea. So that made me think, well, maybe what the Greeks are trying to put across is the 5280 is actually now 5820 times the 5280. They've changed the inner numbers, but they've kept the distance factor so that we can know what measure there is. So then I said that I figured that the outer moon was 14,615 miles from the center of Mars. He said, that seems to be very reasonable, very reasonable. I don't remember what it was thought to be, but that seems very reasonable. What else? And I said, well, Dr. Wood, what I've been challenged on in terms of the use of mile and kilometer is that there are two disparate systems. They can be compared, but only through the conversion between them. So he said, well, what have you done with the challenge? I said, it's simple. I just set it up the way I thought it was. The British foot was not really British. The French meter was not really French. They were inherited measures from the Greek because it was there a long time before it ever found its way to Britain or found its way to France. And I said, I'm helped in this by the fact that the British foot really comes from the solar year. He said, what? I said, you heard me, solar year, that's the basis. And the French meter said he, I said, yes, that comes from the lunar year. He said, oh, now I've heard it all. What do you mean, how is that possible? I said, well, you take 10 solar years at 365.24, just advance it by 10, or 2 times 5, in other words, the two hands and the five fingers on each, because that's man doing the count, like counting hands on a horse, same idea. I said, and then the monkey in the middle there is going to be pi. Which pi? I said, 3.1416. He said, so you agree with that? I said, there's nothing wrong with it. It's absolutely standard. Nothing wrong with it. He said, well, how did you achieve the understanding of that? I said, well, I didn't do it the way you're supposed to do it. I took 22. Uh, well, first of all, I took 3.1416, and I decided if you're 3 plus 1 plus 4 plus 1 plus 6 is 15, well, somehow between 22 and 7, the 22 over 7, there had to be somebody that said a minus 5 and then a minus 5 and a minus 5 coming to the 15. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, 22 minus... 5 is 17, and 17 minus 5 is 12, and 12 minus 5, again, is 7. He said, so what? I said, well, 22 times um, 17 times 12 times 7 is 31416. All you have to do is put a decimal point in each one of those, 4, and you've got 3.1416. I've never seen that, said Dr. Wood. I've never seen that. Do you realize that you have just given the most simple formula that has ever been devised for pi? And I said, no, doctor, I'm not aware of that, but thank you for telling me. Because mm -hmm. now I know that I have some reason to suggest that that's the way it was used over and over again before it became standardized at three point, or written out at 3.1416. So anyway, what you do is you take the solar year 10 times, you divide it by that pi of 31416, and then you divide it again by the solar year, I mean the lunar year, I'm sorry. And he said, and I said, it's 3.280823. He said, that's palindromic. My God, that's palindromic. And of course, that's clear proof that Conversion that we've always used at 3.2808 and chopped off the 23 is proof that the systems were made at the same time. And you're right. The inheritors are the French and the English. You don't have any idea what you've done, have you? And I said, not really. I was just trying to search for some answer as to what the Greeks were saying and why they did what they did. That's all. 
And so he said, all right, tell me more. What do you take the size of the earth to be? I said, palindromically? Oh, I know what the Greeks said. I, I can't tell you if they're right or not, but I think they must be. It's 131, 484, 131 feet. So the 131 is on either side of the center, and the only thing that changes throughout is the center. He said, well, what's the median measure? What's the middle measure? I said, oh, that's the one that gives the rise to the whole thing. That's 262. And 262 by half is 131. And then 222,000 less than that, just as with the first being less than the 488, 448, 484 four, four, rather. Same thing, that's 131-040-131. He said, so you just told me right now that the basic Earth is 24,902, 24,816, and 24,818. I don't think there's anything to be any different than that. That's beautiful. I said, yes, but it's Greek. It's not the nations that have carried the banner for, and we have to give them credit for doing that. The metric system and the English foot. But certainly it puts to rest the idea that some great British brute, royal brute, put his foot down and said, that's my foot. Mm -hmm. This is not true. Well, how did you calculate the uh, moons of Mars? And, and why is that uh, proves that uh, it was a design? Of, because it looks like it's a design, uh, you know, um, controlled situation that the moon's, one's going one direction, the other one's going the other. Right. Uh, but you had this published in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but when did it come to you and how did you get it into the encyclopedia? Well, that's, that's where we go back to the origin of the thing that I was telling Dr. Wood, because it had happened earlier than that. Yeah. Um, I did it when I was five, because I didn't know any better. I didn't know, nobody said, you're not supposed to be able to do this, you're not supposed to even try. So I simply said, okay, well then, let me see what the conversion leads me to in terms of the kilometer. So that meant that the 5820, in terms of miles, was answered by 9366 kilometers for Phobos, the innermost moon of Mars, and the outermost, Deimos, uh, the 14,615, was answered by 23520 kilometers. And then I noted right away that 9366 plus the outer one, 23520, differed from the combination of miles as miles, 14615 plus 5820, uh, by 12451, which was exactly half the Earth's circumference at the equator. You couldn't ask for a more clear statement. Only half the world can look at half the heavens at one time. It was over and done. I knew right then and there what it was, and Dr. Wood saw that, and he said, it's got to be it. It has to be it. Who knows this? And I said, well, one of my grandfather's former clients. He, I can't remember his name right now, but I'm terrible with names, Dr. Wood. Honestly, I would maybe call you Dr. Tree the next time. <laughs> I said, I make the association, but that's as far as I'd go. I said, he's a client of my grandfather's, I know, but because of the stock market and other things, I think the shop was closed, uh, you know, back in the 30s sometime. But he worked at the Lick Observatory, and there was, a, there was an astronomer there named Hammond Wright, who was very interested in the measures that I gave for the Martian moons, kilometer and mile, to this astronomer who was a former client of my grandfather's. Oh. And he said, oh, Hammond's right. I know the name. He's a very honorable gentleman. Did you attach any concerns to the publication or anything? I said, no, just that they be published together he said, for such small moons, that's unlikely to happen. He said, I will call Dr. Wright, and I will put it to him 
since he is one of the great Mars experts. If it's going to be published anywhere, that's the way it has to be. Hmm. And as far as the measures of the dimensions of the Martian moons, which, by the way, it was thought by Hammond Wright that that was going a step too far. He did not put that in the boxes because that would preempt, if it were true, it would preempt the need of NASA having to determine or confirm. Hmm. Very smart move on his part. But he had them, and he knew I did it, and he knew I had a formula for it. Hammond Wright and I eventually did talk with each other, hmm. or speak with each other, and I was, of course, very respectful of his work because I knew how wonderful uh, an astronomer he had been. Um, but he never lived to see the project's uh, real thrust, unfortunately. Now, what they did, which was really dastardly, the Russians had a program, Phobos. They wanted to get close enough to that asteroid to determine something about its origin. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get close enough, possibly to land on it even, but certainly not smash into it. The Russians were given measures and they were said to be mined. The Russians thought they could depend on that. Mm -hmm. Their mission was deliberately destroyed. And our guys were looking right at their consoles and watching it happen. And tell us about when you heard about that. Some years had passed, I can't remember how many. I try not to think of these things. <laughs> That's why you have me around. But... Yeah, but some years had passed and there was a big meeting at MIT. And at the last minute somebody called me and said, Bart, would you please come because there are some Russians that would like to talk to you. I said, well, I'd come anyway. <laughs> we were invited, but nobody did that. They said, well, I'm doing it now. Hop a bus, come on down, if you can do it tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. So I went down to MIT, and indeed, the Russians that were there, one of them very senior, came over and said, Mr. Jordan, I'd like to ask you a question. Why did you deliberately furnish us with false measures? that ended up in the destruction and the loss of the mission. I said, sir, I wouldn't do such a thing. Can you furnish me with those numbers? Yes, I have them here. I was going to ask you to sign them. Hmm. I said, sign them? For what purpose? He said, because if they're your measures, I'd like you to indicate that. I looked at the numbers, I said, it's not a one of them is within a, never mind country mile, try a continent. I said, no, there's no comparison between these numbers and mine. Who gave you these? He said, NASA. And they sat right there at the consoles and looked at the whole thing happening and just didn't even crack a smile or anything, and just sat there deadpan, in effect. And then they said, oh, isn't it too bad? This guy gave us the measures, but, you know, I told you he was unreliable, turning to a colleague or something like that, you know, and they heard all that, they documented all that. So I said, well, actually, no, mine are in Britannica, and they've been there since 66. He said, they're in Britannica? What are they doing in Britannica? I said, due to Hammond Wright, an ancient astronomer who's been gone now for a bit, but he, uh, he put them in there and he kept his word. The kilometers and miles are recorded correctly. And I said, and there's no notice of their being mine since the data taken mostly from the Naval Almanac or something such as that. Mm -hmm. And I said, but that, that's what, you know, I wanted. I've never wanted anybody to know what I was doing that I was doing. I wanted the information out there, not concentration on me. I've had enough of celebrity. I've seen too much of it. I've been through too much of it. My mother was one. And when I was playing, I was one. And so on. And my work with Mother Goddess made even more of one. 
so much so that when I was in university, my art teacher said, Bart, you're the most active feminist I know. I could have gone through the floor. <laughs> the girls were laughing in the class. Some of the guys were smiling. I don't know where she came up with that, but I had just you know, got, received quite a bit of notice for the fact of the mother goddess that I had reconstructed, the Le Pouque statue from southern France. I said, but I, I told the Russians, I said, no. My measure, measure that, well, can you write them out for us and then sign it? I said, oh, certainly. Can you mount another mission? He said, not a right, right away, but we'll try. It was a very expensive mission we lost. And it means a lot to us. So I put the figures down right there. And then I showed him the matter of the addition and whatnot. Right. I said, but no scientist even picked up on that. Well, we didn't even know they were there. We had no idea. And we didn't think to look because Britannica was usually quoting something from somewhere and it said Naval Almanac, probably, as you say. We don't know. I said, I don't remember. I never went into it that deeply. And he said, but so you are not at fault. Excuse me a minute. And he came back and he said, my colleagues want to extend through me our deepest apology. Thank you for your fortune rightness, your candor. Your countrymen don't really value what you've tried to do. We know that. We wish we had known more about it when you were in Russia. The only thing we knew was that you're a musician. It's apparently far more than that. I said yes, but I try to stay under the radar for a lot of reasons. And not a little of it is because I don't like all of the stuff that happens between colleagues in the various fields that I do have contact with. That it was easy enough. I simply took the position that Venus was up here as the face. And if that were true, I would have to go to my reading of the velocity of light, which very early, I was again five years old, I didn't know any better, I think that's a lot of it right there, and I would receive these transmissions without knowing what to do, but I saw this thing and I said, well, Venus is the brightest thing in the heavens besides the sun and the moon, and sometimes she's even brighter than the moon. Because the moon can get dull from time to time, and Venus is almost always bright. And so I thought, well, if it's a velocity of light figure and all they have is 186,000 miles, nah, that's not right. I said, but Venus as the mother goddess was also the trinity before it became this father, son, and holy ghost or whatever. That was rubbish. That was, a, that was a makeover, a macho makeover, as usual, of something. It was the goddess's province. She was the morning star, she was the evening star, and she was Venus proper. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it up. That's it. You know, stop this, all this other stuff. You know, but the Catholic Church, well, I was a Catholic, so I know all too well. Anyway, the point was, I simply said, okay, so either she's 584, 584 as morning star, evening star, or she's double five, double eight, double four. If you put either one or the other over three, the answer comes up real quick. The second choice is right. It was double five, double eight, double four, over three. What is that equal? Pardon? What is that equal? 186,000, but beyond that, uh -huh. 281. Point three repetan three trinity forever. Ah. Unless you knew enough to then put a subtractive schedule of four moons, like outriggers on canoes, either side. Einstein, when I visited with him, after I was in that school, that they sent me to, uh, forced me to go to, of Loomis, which Loomis was a trustee, of course, 
and his stepsons went there. When I got there with the priest and the rabbi who were friends, and they were both interested in science, tremendously so, and that was the basis for their friendship. One was a Catholic priest, the other was a rabbi. Both of them very young. I wouldn't go see Einstein when Lawrence wanted me to. No, I didn't want to go see him at all. He was a great man. No, no, no. But when this rabbi had a friend, excuse me, had his uncle, rather, who was a friend of Einstein's, or an acquaintance at least, in some regard, that the invitation came that way, I sort of couldn't refuse these two very genuine people within their different faiths coming together. I, that togetherness just brought me to my feet, and I said, okay, if, if I am to go there, I will. And so I went down with them. I was excused from the school. It was kept very secret. And I went down to visit him at IAS, that's the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And I was told the meeting was supposed to last 20 minutes to a half hour. We were together in that room for six hours with one glass of water between us. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> one glass of water between us. To that. I had come to the meeting with a 35 page paper replete with footnotes, which I don't remember how many pages those were. He said, well, the main interest I have here in the moment is your velocity of light. Put it on the board, if you will. The moment I put double five, double eight, double four on the board over three, he said, you don't have to tell me what you did, I know. And they couldn't have done it without you. They could not have done it without you. He so he knew, he knew about it. Yeah. He said, I had a forecast of this paper, and he said, actually, I already had some abstracts from it. But the velocity of light was not one of them. Anyway, most of what Einstein had to say to me, he was more comfortable in German, and that was fine for me because I was fluent. What I think, though, that was most apparent to him was that my study of Aramaic had in it a potential for what came to be the investigative tools going into Viking. There's a word that they say is Hebrew. No, it's Aramaic. Even though they have, the scholars have not hit upon that, I, it has to be Aramaic. The word is Agmon. And the word is used to describe Moses and the bulrushes. So of course it has to be Hebrew. <laughs> but no, it isn't. It's, 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 it's Chaldean. The point is that the frequencies of that, I could have brought them today, but I didn't. We can do that some other time. The frequencies involved there are pointedly Mars. You couldn't miss it. You got 780, you got 26 for iron. You got exactly what was produced in, uh, I made no mention of, of course, at the time. But in Nero, since you mentioned, it's exactly that same frame. Well, Einstein, when he saw that, he said, so the story itself is a way of preserving the idea that the cattail reed was not only related to what was used by the scribes to write, it was also because these are how tall did you say? I said on average about 2.5 meters. He said, well, <laughs> It'd take two of me, <laughs> but or something like that. But he said, so you're saying that those common reeds that grow in the swamps, which backs up the story of Moses and the bulrushes, that that is actually not only related to the scribes, 
but it's also the unit of measure. I said yes, and I suspect there's a site northeast of Mexico City called by the Spaniards because they had tin ears, Teotihuacan, but it's Teotihuacan, really. And I said, I suspect very roundly, because that means cattail reed in a sense, that it's also referred to as Nazarios. He said, what, Nazarene? I said, that's correct. He said, but how could that be? And I said, well, Dr. Einstein, it comes from the fact that it was the Bosque engineers that gave rise to that great complex. And they used to wear a scapula, more or less, I don't have it right here, but um, which represents this site. Much like priests wear scapulas now, but this was devoted to the goddess. And that's what the summary of those numbers are. He said, explain. So I launched into what I consider to be the model of what was on Mars, focused on a particular latitude, which was 4087. And I gave him my reasons for it. And he said, and you, see, you say you've seen this. I said, yes, sir, I have. And you've seen it in two conditions. Yes. One, beautiful beyond description. The other, damaged. But let me use the word selectively, because I think it applies. And these were nuclear strikes from the air. The other that was in great... Uh, Abundance was the destruction just done by the runaway condition of climate in the collapse of the atmosphere. So you have great piles of sand, you have wind blown everywhere, and you probably have the onrush of water in various streams or with rivulets in the stream that came from such powerful. Uh, destruction when the atmosphere collapsed and he said what are you telling me I said well I guess I'm telling you that my life is probably going to be taken up with trying to make people aware that it's going to happen here if we don't put these nuclear things away doctor we've got to put them away and we've got to try to survive man is about the only creature I know of that actively fouls his nest. For what purpose? Everywhere you look. Everywhere you look. He said, I agree with you, little boy, but you know something? If you keep talking like this, you'll never reach manhood. They'll kill you. Because you know what you know. They don't want you to say what you know. I said, well, sir, we've just come out of a war. A horrible event that took so, so many lives. And it's not just the six million Jews, 13 millions involved or more. We don't really know the count, do we? And then there were the soldiers the soldiers, who just do what they do because they're good citizens. And I said, you know, Caesar said something about, of course, in recent times, let's deal with Goethe. He said, in terms of Germans, he said, and he of course was one, he said, admirable in the individual, abominable in the mass. And he meant it. But I said, Dr. Einstein, you very well might relate to what Caesar said, because you do know that he went up against the Swiss Cantons and Vercingetorix. He said, yes, I remember that from my school days. 
I said, well, he said there was one great flaw in the German character. It was the comitatus. He said, well, I don't really know Latin. And I said, it means commitment to the leader, sir. Commitment to the leader. And that's not just a flaw in German character. It's a flaw of humankind. But the flaw is generally governed by, again, money. He said, which is why we have that term or that statement about money is the root of all evil. <laughs> it most certainly looks more and more like that as you speak. And I said, well, it can do wonderful things, but it can also be responsible for some horrible things. And you're right, I probably will be plagued for the rest of my days. Oh, and you got uh, beat up when you got back to the school. Well, when I got back to the school, yeah, now that you mentioned that, that's very uncomfortable thinking about it. But I came back to the school, and the headmaster, happened to be a German name, Renke, he got a hold of me and he said, you were gone longer than we allowed. And I said, well, that's because I was with him for six hours and I guess we had a glass of water between us, but then we had supper as soon as he took me to the house on Mercer Street and he saw to his family in the house. But his girl Friday, more or less, Helen Dukas, um, put together things very nicely for us and read him portions of the document that he had put aside for the moment because he liked the way that she had a clip at which she could read things. And, um, and of course, she knew German, so you know that was easy for her to translate something right away as she read it. And so I said, yes, I said, the priest and the rabbi stayed at the older rabbi's house, which was the uncle that knew Einstein, as far as I remember. And I was put up there too. Mm. You know, wasn't that far, it was, you know, in, within the precinct of, pre, of Princeton. Uh, it was nice to be in a house of, you know, some wonderfully warm people. And of course Einstein had been very, very good to me. I, I can't tell you. He had taken out his violin, of all things, and played snatches of this and snatches of that, bits of this, bits of that. He was out of shape. But the spirit of the man, you knew music was in his heart. No question about it. It was a wonderful event. And he was just so generous. I remember, too, that he had a little poem he had made up in English, and he was quite determined to say it. Actually, he handed me a little card that he had written it out, and it was in English, too. He said, if I am one stone, because German is Einstein, Eine, one, Stein stone. If I am one stone, you are three, you are Trinity. Now, he had prepared that before I came. So he already knew <coughs> that even without the formula for the velocity of light, I had to be the one that did what I did. He Which had that to, much of an abstract. Uh, communicate to them exactly what would happen within the, uh, the explosion. Well, he had been told that I had likened it to something that was very unlikely to be likened to. Did I say that right? He said that you claimed that it was like a raindrop. And that's why that picture that Dr. Wood saw. You had said that there's an angle of refraction for entrance. There's reflection on the back wall of the person who's looking at it. And then there's an exit refraction, or refraction of exit uh, that's an uh, 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 angle that's there. And that the whole thing 
could be expressed as refraction, reflection, refraction, explosion, implosion, explosion. And that all you had to do was determine what was going to happen within what length of time. And you said that your experimentation with uh, the atomic weights involved, regardless of quantity involved, or irrespective of quantity, that between that and your belief that your resonance factor of the 235 would supply the standard bearer for the totality of all four isotopes, two that were fissionable, two that were not, the two outer and the two inner. So you said these things, and it was reported to me that you also did it against the velocity of light, which wasn't there. And I wanted to know what you took that to be. But he said what was there was the fact that you could find it to 15 milliseconds. And he said, frankly, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that. How would you possibly know 15 milliseconds? And that before that, there was a arc point at six milliseconds, you could also define by meter and by foot if you had to. And I said, yeah, that's what Dr. Wood saw. He said, well, that's what was said. That's what was communicated to me. What do you show me now? And I said, do you really want to see that? I said, it came to be something else. Because bombs were made of both. He said, yes, I want to see it. So I showed him, and he said, well, I see what you're saying. That it wouldn't have mattered whether you used 235 or 239. The result would have been the same within the 15 milliseconds, which is why you can find it to that. But you had said not to use any of the 235. Can you tell me why that was made? And I said, because. We will need it someday. But now, it makes no sense to talk about it at all, or to speak of it, because it's no longer there to use. And I said, you know, we're just a very foolish species. Mm. You know? Now, Having said that, I will return to the matter of what happened in the school. I came back. Mr. Ranke told me to report to his office. The problem was the study hall bill had run, and we're supposed to be in our seats. So I had waited at his office. He didn't show up. I waited and waited and waited. And finally, Ms. Profesoli, a little Italian girl who was his secretary, she said, you better get to your seat. I'll tell him that you waited. That wasn't good enough. She could tell him whatever she wanted. He wanted me to wait there regardless. But he could break the rules, but not me. I was given my instruction, so I left, and I was sitting in my seat, and all of a sudden, a big hand grabbed me under the throat, pulled me from the back with the other hand, and I was jolted out of my seat and made to try to regain my feet as he dragged me along. I told you to wait for me, and you didn't. And he dragged me into his office, dragged me past Miss Profesoli, and then he said, bend over. I knew what was coming. We had something called a flexible flyer. And it was a wonderful invention. It had a wooden handle, and the rest of it was a nice leather strap of tremendous weight, uh, especially when an arm was behind it, flogging you with it. Oh, they were called swats. Most times, the council, the boys, rendered swats. No boy had ever been given in that school more than 
far as I know, than four swats. That was enough. Twenty-six of them. Twenty-six of them. And he left me bleeding, but I didn't know I was bleeding until I went past Miss Profesoli, and she said, Bart, stop. I said, why? She said, you're bleeding. I said, well, I think it's a little wet back there, but I don't know why I'd be bleeding. She said, you're bleeding. Stop. So I stopped. And she said, I, I heard whack, 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 whack. How many swats did you receive? I said, 26. I counted every one. But you never cried out. I said, no. I wouldn't give him the satisfaction. No. Call me a Spartan if you like. Because oftentimes the kids didn't call me Spartacus, they called me Bardicus. Mm -hmm. And I knew what they were referring to, I understood it. But she said, you come with me. And she dragged me right up to the infirmary, and they called in the school doctor, and they wanted to prefer charges against him. His own employees mm -hmm. wanted to do, especially the doctor, because he had a son in that school. And I said, please, God, don't do that. I maintain my silence. Don't do anything like that, please. And tell not my parents, because sure, hell will follow. No, please. The doctor said, I don't know why, but I know one thing. If it's that important to you, we won't. But we're taking you to hospital nonetheless. So he and the secretary took me, I think it was, I can't remember whether it was Framingham or Worcester, but whichever one was closer, I think it was Framingham. But the doctor had to put uh, the thing together. He said, this, this is a very, very, very severe beating. What's going to be done about it? And again, I, I pleaded. I said, no, I just can't have you do that. I can't have this come out because everything else will come out with it. And I can't permit that. And of course, what I feared for was my, never mind myself, but I feared for my family's life. Because I thought Loomis would keep his word, or at least the word he'd given me. And how do you tell a 10-year-old at that point even, I was 10, beaten or otherwise, that, oh, no, that's not going to happen. You can't tell somebody like that, something like that because I saw the evidences of how rageful he could become. So I just bore with it, and I bear the scars, you know. Because you, I mean, I'm just using the photos I was given. NASA would not give me, and even though I was the person who did the basis for the mission, they wouldn't give me a copy of 35A72. Yeah. It's original, you know, form which is really nasty. So I used uh, the DiPietro thing, but you could look in the book and you could see that that northwest corner up there is unreadable practically, so the, the pyramid virtually disappears. However, you can see the same thing here, which is why I just outlined it. Yeah. You can see it all right. It's there. But the point is, the, since the whole mission is pinned on that five-sided pyramid, why is NASA doing what it's doing toward me? That's what I don't really understand except that I do understand. They want to preserve their contracts, and they want to augment those contracts. They've always said that, I mean, they've always cried poor mouth ever since I remember. And I have said, you wouldn't have to cry poor mouth if you were not cooperating in this venture that will never come to pass. Weaponizing space is in the overall wholly in, uh, unreliable. There are too many things that can go wrong. And the point is, first of all, you have no ethical position that would allow for it. But the other thing is that it's impossible to affect economically expeditiously, even from a military standpoint, with the most 
incredible degree of cooperation of elements. But they must realize that by now, right? Well, after they've exploded so many things and, and trying to get rid of the Van Allen, punch a hole in it, I mean, oh my God. So they're trying to not just weaponize space, but they want to maintain myths and falsehoods. Oh, yes. And, and the Apollo lunar mission, which you referred to the last time we spoke, uh, that you're aware of it in faith, and that um, the radiation belts um, or girdle goes beyond uh, what's stated, uh, it goes up to 400,000 miles or over that? Well, I had said what I did, and I, and I had it in the file in, in 45. Uh, but I was talking about it in or with relation to the vector element of where Cydonia was. Yeah. I was treating it in that vein, saying this is what information we have. Why don't we hold with that? Yeah. I mean, here you had three missions. Two of them probes of Mars. The mission, Mariner 9, I mean, of course, there were backups behind that. Because yeah. if you did it for the one... You weren't focused on the final one, really. It just happened to be nine. And by the way, they published Mariner 9. They published a, a whole booklet on it. I mean, book on it, not a booklet, but an actual book. And they were so embarrassed by what they had for one of Mariner 9's principal jobs was to determine the actual dimensions of the Martian moons mm -hmm. because those had not been done, right. except for me. Right. <laughs> I had done that's the fly-by news challenge. We were trying to get someone else to give us another explanation of yeah. how that got in the Encyclopedia like Britannica. Right. It was well, that was not there. The dimensions were not there. Yeah. Hammond well, Wright held those back because he said, you can't do that because, it, you know, there's preemption here. Oh. And the, and the mission will never take place. Oh, I see. So we did it to protect the ignorance that was there. Oh. Uh, because if we didn't, the mission would have been scotched. But once... Mariner 9 had done what it do, did, they blew four of the positions out of the water. But this one brave individual kept the other in place. I think it was a woman. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it were a female because would a male think that it was that important to preserve Aphrodite? I rather doubt that. But she, once she saw that measure, and I'm assuming it is she, she said, oh boy. The whole basis, the entire basis, had to be. And she would have been right. If I had had a chance to talk to the charmer, I would have told her that. Now, the, the two moons are in a very unusual place, and you're saying that relates to a harmony of spheres? Can oh, you, yeah. Can but you describe that in relationship to these moons? Well, it's there but in an indirect way it's not directly there but it's what is directly there is what is the activity that those moons are forecasting with what is already here uh -huh. so we should have been able to look at those moons and get from them the information that I gave you in encapsulated form they were saying to us in effect when you actually can get up here and look at this you're going to see some commentary, very heavy commentary, on the nuclearity or the, the uh, nuclear effects of what you're engaging in because this is part of what we had come here to do before the atmosphere collapsed. And the Bible, in a way, says that in terms of going from Adam to Noah, the flood of Noah not Noah's life entire, but the flood of Noah, mm -hmm. which is 1,656 years. Now, uh, that's well known to a lot of people, a lot of scholars know that period, but they don't know what it refers to. Well, somebody should have just divided it by four. That would have been helpful, because then you see it would be 414, repeated four times. But the 414 would be the position on a musical string or a tether going up the line. 101, Mercury. 212, Venus. 313, Earth. There you are. 414, Mars. Up through 919. Hmm. 
very simple. It added up to 4, 6, 3, 5. And now you look at the Martian moons, which were 1818 18 minutes and 459, the fastest thing in the solar system, Phobos. And then you look at the two girl moons, which were not known until I said that they were there. Now, again, you know, my measurements were given to Kuiper, who actually located the moon that we, or they called Miranda, after a heroine of Shakespeare's. That's lovely, except that that really, to the Greeks, was Armonia. And the thing which was, uh, I just think it was discovered the same year as uh, Phobos and Deimos, um, the one they call Cleopatra, 216. Yep. And it's supposed to be a dog bone. <laughs> no, really, it's a horse bone. It's a tibia of a horse, not a dog. But, I mean, you know, if you're looking for bones, that's one thing that the Greeks would have owned, too. Yes, a horse bone. But in any event, it's 323. Three. Now, I don't remember how many authors were on that egregiously written article, but they did not quote the thing correctly. They gave a time, and it was a general time, but it's like they did with everything else. You know, they took the most foolish expression of the number and put that there, just the way they do things. Uh, it also told you nothing. But the 323 three would tell you everything because it was obviously symmetrical again. Um, palindromic. So if you add it up, the 1818, the 459 of Deimos and Phobos, and then not, I know, not Armonia, because that's the 2035, but the 323, three, which is the dog bone, so-called, Inomra, it's Armonia's name from the other direction. Yeah. You can hear it. Armonia Inomra. Uh, I mean, how much difficulty is there to that? But it's a reflection of one or the other. That's the point. Well, that's 2358, and the total of 2277 and 2358, the combined times, 4, 6, 3, 5. Exactly the same thing of going 1, 1, 1, all the way up to 919, and that is like the strings that hold the planets together and make of it a package that we can look at. I tried to get the astronomical union uh, business turned around because to say, look at how confusing this is to children. Just like not being able to explain the difference between a tetrachord and a tri trichord. In fact, trichord is no longer in the dictionary. It doesn't exist. It's in the Greek dictionary, but nobody else's. Trichordos, you know, three strings. Okay. But here you go. I said to the august body of these brilliant astronomers. I said, why do you make Earth one and Venus less than one and poor little Mercury less than Venus? I mean, it's fractional. Children cannot deal with that. I have taught little ones. Plus I have some. I said, no. Mercury from Earth should be the measure. That's one. Venus is approximately twice the distance. Earth is approximately three times the distance. And Mars is approximately four times the distance. Then you puddle jump. Because you have the asteroid belt. Mars is the last stop for the basic proportion. But then you go to Jupiter, that's 13 away. And then you go to Saturn, which is... 25 away, which is why Saturn is the standard bearer for the Greek alphabet, because it has 25 letters in it. I would go crazy trying to talk to these people. And then I said, you know, you jump to something else, and then something else after that. The total is 277. But if you have it in those proportions, and you see it, Children can take a ball of string and knot it up and knot it up and knot it up until they come to the end. And then they can drag it around the classroom and say, I've got this and i got that. I mean, they love this kind of thing. I did it with little kids. And they were 
happy to know that they had something. They had a planet in their hands on the string and they could walk around and say, I represent so and so. And so it works. And I said, why not do that? Because in the end, the cultures that gave you all this did. And you are failing to carry the information so carefully preserved for thousands of years. How can you as educators take this position? You're robbing the people of the common thing. And Voltaire said, Voltaire dit, les bons sens n'est pas ça, n'est pas si commun. In other words, the good sense is not so common, Voltaire said. He's right about that. Hmm. Voltaire dit. So the harmony of spheres has a relationship to the moons and the Cydonia region. It does because it's reflective of the same type of thinking. It's not the and it was designed so that's it's the design the element. Yes, and the harmony of spheres design uh, was already published. Yeah. And what it was was very simply: you start with an arc over here, and then you go as the ox plows, go here, as if you're doing contour farming, you put another arc here, you come in a little bit, put another arc here, another uh, span, then an arc, and a span, another arc. So you have five arcs. But then you take the first one, you leave it up there. The second one, you turn down. The third one, you leave up there. The fourth one, you turn down. Right. And the fifth one, you leave up there. So now you have something that looks like a coiled up necklace and it was called harmonious necklace. Ah. It's right there in the Greek. What the hell are you needing for a reason not to play this game the way you're playing it? And that was shaped on Sidonia, harmonious necklace? Was well, it, it's right there. the Tholos? It's right there. No, oh. it's right there in the it's right there in the in the Tholos. Yeah, the Tholos. Yeah, it's yeah. but it's the atomic bomb at the yeah. same time. So these are coexisting measures, but used differently. But that's why there's a foot for every single solitary frequency hertz position. And they're paired in what I gave you. Those things can all be pushed, uh, can be all put up when we get this thing put together with the, the uh, equations. Hmm. But they're just as clear as crystal. When you see it, there's no problem with it. Are you going to go through any of the equations today to show what your what you produce? Well, we, we're going to we're going to we're going to put them up there so that they, they're a little bit complicated to dialogue. No, I mean directly. you can you can dialogue it and then we'll have it on there so they'll they'll be able to look at it while you say it. You, well, I can I can do this. I can take the one that starts it all off, okay. the Greek. Yeah, I can I, do I, that. I like to give people. I can't a, do the yeah. I can't do the Germanic one because of the fact it's a gap scale. The same thing with the Semitic one. While we're on that subject, by the way, there has been a standard problem that has existed forever and a day, and it connects with the greatest epic that was ever written about war. That's the Iliad and the Odyssey. The thing that you look at is how did the 48, 39, 62 come to be? That's before you divide it by 100, which is just to put it in the frequency mode. But that's what's behind here. The other one is advanced with a greater number, but that's because you have more frequencies to put in there. But the basis of it is the Greek, alpha 2 omega. So what is it that it's doing? The number is derived from the hours, minutes, and seconds of Mars. I'll put it that way. It's very simple to do it that way. We'll have the equation up later. Okay. And then underneath that is uh, the orbit of Deimos. Underneath that is the orbit of Phobos. Then underneath that, on the other side, is the orbit of um, the so-called dog bone. And then underneath that is the orbit of Harmonia. And underneath that, finally, is the 235604, which identifies ourselves. The total is 483962. You simply divide it by 100, and that gives you everything from alpha to omega, and that is the complete, that is the complete story.
And that's the only scale that is not gapped. Now, in this great epic of the Iliad and the Odyssey, you have two people pro opposed. The Achaeans, or known as the Greeks in this case, and the Trojans. Nobody has ever known who the Trojans really were. What was their racial composition? Well, one of those formulae that gives you the line count of the Iliad and the Odyssey. If you understand how the formula is put together, it has a 325 on the Greek side and a 264 on the other side. The 264 is none other than a Semitic culture. Not Jews, but Semites. This one is definitely the piece. Oh, I mean this. So the this resistance? There's, there is no, there's no question about this one. It can't be questioned because this is the one that has the forty. Are you recording this? Yes. This is the one that has the forty eighty seven. But notice something: the forty eighty seven is in the uh, statement of what this distance is of the Martian site itself. But what you have to do is take this 4087, which is central here, and go back to this formula because it's the one that supports the 90, which is here. And that's the one that has 4087 on either end. Look at it. It's right there. Now that means I was the one to say this is what needs to be the approach vector position because if you don't use it, you're never going to hit the target. It's like you have an arrowhead and it's... Or a spearhead. That's what you do with vectors. Oh, yeah. They have to have intersect one. Hmm? And so it's there. It's exactly what it should be. It states what it should be, and it's right there. And you can't miss it because you're only d having the uh, divisional unit be 100,000. Well, the fact remains if it's 100,000 on either side, so it's obviously symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. And then it goes further than that because it takes this whole number right across here and goes right down in the column and what do you see? Exactly what I described before. You have the 180 on either side. You have the 4230, which is the cattail reed, the tail table con, and in here is the summary of the Trinity test or the atom bomb. Mm -hmm. now, it can't be any clearer than that. That is so damn clear because it says exactly what is the intention mm. of the people who put this stuff on that site in this particular way. Right. I mean, I don't know how else to put this. This, this makes it, and this brings it down to the point of pablum practically. <laughs> mm. You know, it's so easy to understand. And only they, because they put the stuff in place, only they could do it. We don't have mathematicians that can do this now. We know where it's near. And the thing is that what you have too is this starts at the 600 and goes this way. Well, all you have to do is fill in the lines and you got the five-sided pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's the sign of that. Huh. That's all you needed. <laughs> and anybody who knew what was being... Uh, exposed in the process of it would have also the willingness and the awareness to say weapons aside it's done stop it but no not us mm. we're just bigger and better than anybody else and we know everything you know the american attitude i mean do you know that those Russians, those poor devils, they, they looked at me from one to the other, they looked back and they said, why did they do this to us? What is it about your countrymen? They just can't do something in a straight way. I said, well, that's our reputation of you too. I think the problem of this is that you have to do human to human. You have to go step by step. And you have to recognize. I said, look, you have uh, a gentleman named Kanarzov, who was probably one of the most forward people in thinking, uh, most forward thinking people rather, uh, concerning the Maya having a phonetic 
content to the language. And in the actual illustrations of the glyphs, he was ridiculed over and over by Western sources. And I told Proskurikov, I said, it's a pity that I don't speak Russian. I tried to get in contact with him in Leningrad when, you know, several times, and that was not possible. I tried. But I said, Tanya, I believe in what he's saying, and I've got the best reason in the world. And she said, what's that? I said, your scholarship has resulted in at least Pakal being recognized as Lord Shield. But his grandfather is basically put on the shelf. And she said, what is his name? I said, well, I was given it again as a child. It's Han, it's Han the first part, followed by Abi. And then the second part is Pak Ali. Han Abi Pak Ali. Said exactly as one would have said it in that day. Not as Han Abi Pak Ali. And the point is, it's not an ah, as there. It's not an ah, Pak Ali. It's a Pak Ali, e, 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 a sound. That is an iota in Greek. It's Han Abi Pak Ali. And I said, now, I will give you the formula. I will show you the formula that proves beyond any question he knew of the site of Sidonia, Mars. And he is recorded in that sense. And she said, you mean those Viking pictures? I said, yes, those Viking pictures. She said, my colleagues will never accept it. They'll do everything they can to resist you. I said, well, that's their lookout. Because here's the problem. Somebody, someday has to begin to believe this. Because this guy knew that the nuclear outcome would be something that would end life and this species without the effort to stop it. The grandfather knew that. That's why, even though he doesn't have a ruler's pectoral, he's got the portraiture on the sepulcher. That's why he's there on the, on the, uh, on the tomb. And she said, well, that has never been answered by my colleagues. They don't understand that. Because if he's not the ruler, why is he? I said, because he was the Samanamas. He was the one who knew. He was the seer. Mm. I said, and that's what really accounts for the Temple of Inscriptions. And she just was blown away by that. She said, well, already you've told me more than anybody, and you're not a Mayanist, and yet you know. And I said, well, that's right. You know, I don't even know how to say good morning in any Maya language, of which there are probably about 31, <laughs> something like that. And she said, well, you got that right. Well, anyway, that's the story. So, uh, apart from this, which is perhaps the most important thing to establish, this in itself has another equation connected with it, which is very powerful stuff. Very po I just didn't include it here. But this is the one that directly tells you why this is what it is. And the whole thing is a case. You see these columns every single time they're arranged the same way. And what they are is examples of reciprocal resonance. In other words, this number here then goes down this way. Mm -hmm. Haven't you seen that? Every single one of them does the same thing. It follows the pattern of the Greek key. These go across, these go down, these go up, and this goes across again this way. Would you Everyone. consider that proof? I mean, can scientists that would look at that, if they spend enough time looking at those formulas, would they see it? Many of those people would go, oh, that's a coincidence. That's just a happy little coincidence. And then they would dismiss it. They won't but, look at all the coincidences. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And as I, I met said, an astrophysicist this weekend that said that. Pardon? I met an astrophysicist and I mentioned about you and your work. And, and he <clears throat> just said that <clears throat> it's numerology and a coincidence. You know, well, of course they dismiss it. Yeah. Because they kind of, but the one. But he that, hasn't looked at it yet, even. I, I well, I did, of course, of course. It, well, he doesn't have to look at it. He already knows I'm a, I'm a charlatan or a phony or something, you know, in his mind. 
the fact remains that all you have to do is take this little item and hold it up to the event itself. Never mind that. Just hold it up and look at it at 16 milliseconds, even though it's a little out distanced. The basic frame is exact. And the six millisecond is in here. That's the thing that threw, that's the thing that threw uh, Lawrence completely. He said, how was he able to do that? How in the world was he able to do that? We none of us had any idea that it reached an arc of 180, except when we saw it at, on the frame. Well, you know, we'll probably end this program with your uh, remembrance piece. Can you talk about your creation of that music piece uh, that is a, uh, a memory of Roslyn? Well, actually what happened there, it was the 18th of December, 1968. <laughs> this is way off the subject of Mars and this like, but I, I, I was called suddenly by um, the executive secretary, not typist, but uh, of the Guitar Society, Martha Nelson. Uh, a very tall, beautiful individual who looked a little bit like Celeste Holm, but even better looking, I think. And she was um, uh, somebody who was a mainstay in the society, classical society, the guitar, uh, classical guitar society in New York, Society of the Classical Guitar, I got it right, eventually. And she called me and she said, Bart, the Waverly Concert is supposed to be having its uh, premiere performance uh, with us. But the person that was supposed to play, um, in terms of introducing this program before, you know, in other words, another player before they're coming out, can't do it. I said, well, what is it you're asking from me? And she said, just come, but bring your guitar. <laughs> so I said, okay, I got it. I got there, and not only was Segovia there, my teacher, but there was Saint de la Mata, Rey de la Torre, Mario Escudaro. I mean, just about every bloody guitarist who was a great instrumentalist on his own was there, and the women were there uh, that were good, and very good in some cases. And then there were also some of the jazz artists, band uh, guitarists that I had amplified their techniques that played for ABC, NBC, CBS, they were there. Oh, I just threw up my hands. I said, Martha, I'm not prepared for this. And she said, you are, just play. <laughs> so I went up there and Segovia was right in front of me by about seven or eight feet. And so it went on. And I'm looking out there at this August body of my peers and I thought to myself, what do I do now? So I started to play a basic pro program, you know, Greek, medieval, uh, Renaissance stuff or whatever. And Maestro, after about seven or eight pieces, which was like about a third of the program, mm. said, um, Momento por favor, solamente improvisación. And so he said, in a moment please, just, just now, improvisation mm. only. So I thought, oh my God. So I started to play with, that was the portrait in D. And um, I had never played anything of any of them except the fourth one. Some bloke in the back said, uh, and it was a distinctly British voice with uh, the same kind of accent that uh, Julian Bream had. Uh -huh. And they were boyhood friends and she, Ballet antique, please, ballet antique. And so it was something which referred back to the time when I was called uh, out to uh, help with the situation. Um, they were practicing a ballet and uh, they were um, in rehearsal. And this male dancer uh, made these wide leaps and was always hitting the floor off the beat and he was dancing with Margot Fontaine, the head ballerina of the London Ballet. So she was glum.
coming out of that rehearsal, and the chorus girls loved her, so they came over to me and said, Bart, you got your guitar, please come in and entertain her in some way, make her feel good. So I came and then I composed this little piece, and somehow the word got out, and so that's what this guy asked me. That was the one improv that I'd done before that I repeated, oh. that's the fourth one. But then I played everything else just flat out, and uh, so, uh, I, all I can say is that the I was one with one piece that celebrated my daughter, one that celebrated my son. You know that was not unusual for me to do, and one with a portrait indeed starting for the whole family. And then other things came up, and I sort of celebrated certain people in my mind. Uh, one has to remember something about a rescue swimmer: the magic of one event. I'll never forget it. I was in the North Sea, of course. And this fishing boat, I don't want to go into the whole nine yards, but it was in a lot of trouble because the propeller and the nets had gotten together. And uh, the marriage of that is not exactly called for. And it had stopped the boat, and it was, you know, and the waves were just cutting it to pieces. So over the side, he went to a fisherman to untangle the situation, but his mate did not cut the motor enough. So instead of just freeing it up, it cut him. Blood was in the water. One of the rescue swimmers went, who was closest to went for him. But in the meantime, a wave had come and knocked his companion into the water. The boat was now with nothing in it and his daughter. And so I went for the little girl. About the time I went over the side, she was about maybe 90 to 110 yards away. By the time I reached her, she was over 200 yards. That's how heavy the sea was. That's how difficult it was. But I knew something. I kept hearing the word here, here, which was the most intelligent word she could have chosen because it was H-E-R-E -E and H-E-A-R. So she was saying here, here. And what I saw on the horizon was six foot dorsal fins. And I said, uh-huh, we're gonna be all right. They were orcas, orcas. The sharks scattered. They wouldn't be anywhere, even with the blood in the water. They'd get out of there, because any orca can kill sharks like that. Just ram them, that's it. Even, even porpoises and dolphins do that. So I reached her, and the little thing was suffering, obviously, from hypothermia, you know, like her dad was, like the other guy was. But she didn't care. She kept saying, I want to see my father, I want to see my father. Years later, I was up in Yorkshire, and a woman, and a now young, very beautiful young girl, but in her 20s, she said, here, here, and I knew the voice, and she said, do you remember me? I said, how could I forget? Child, how could I forget? And she said, well, my father's okay, everybody's okay. And I certainly am okay. Thank you. I've never forgotten that because as much as I didn't let emotion get to me as a swimmer, that one did. And that too, I won't tell you which one, but that too is in amongst the pieces. You don't want us to play that one? I don't know. I want them all played, but I won't tell you which one it is because yeah. I think that's a very private issue. Okay. But I just think that I still.